And we are live. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this formal debate between Carl Benjamin, a.k.a. Sargon of Akkad, and Dr. Christy Winters. We, the skeptic feminists, or just feminist singular, will be your moderators. The motion is, is feminism good for the world? Dr. Winters will be arguing for the affirmative, Mr. Benjamin for the negative. I'm going to do some quick introductions. Dr. Christy Winters earned her BA from University of Wisconsin. <laughs> One second. That was a train. <laughs> I, I, I thought we had sabotaged all the lines, but uh, apparently one got through somehow. Our our supervillain cred is now on the line. Apologies. One moment. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's that's good enough. All right. <clears throat> Dr. Christy Winters earned her BA from University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh, where she was elected Student Association President and to the Winnebago County Board. She worked in Wisconsin Democratic politics, eventually becoming Chief of Staff for a state senator. In 03, she left the USA to earn her Master's and PhD from the University of Essex in the UK. Dr. Winters served as senior research officer for the 05 British election study and is a British Ac uh, Academy postdoctoral fellow. She has published research on sex, gender, and British politics and served as a co-convener for the Women and Politics Specialist Group of the UK Political Studies Association. Dr. Winters worked at Gaysis Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences and has recently received funding with two other British researchers to replicate her doctoral findings for publication in a book on sex, gender, and British politics. And now, last but not least, Carl Benjamin, better known as Sargon of Akkad, is a guy with a YouTube channel. End of introduction for him. Each debater will be given 10 minutes for his or her opening for or against the motion. Next, each debater will get two rounds of formal rebuttals alternating, lasting five minutes each. The debate will conclude with five-minute closing statements. Each speaker has submitted to us a list of sources and online links to every study or empirical assertion they will be citing. These links can be found in the description of the video. The speakers must specify which of the sources they are citing during the debate. Asserting a claim not sourced will be treated as an argument from ignorance, as per Matt Dillahunty, and disregarded. To make this clear, if there is a claim proposed and that claim is disputed, the burden of proof falls onto the proponent of the claim. If there is no agreeable evidence to support a claim, the claim is considered to be an argument from ignorance. Our personal adage here this evening is what can be asserted without evidence will be dismissed without evidence. There will be no crosstalk. Speakers will use their time uninterrupted, and we will enforce the mute feature to prevent background interference. We, the moderators, will be taking notes of any well-constructed and concise questions from the viewers in the live chat to be asked of the debaters during the 30 minutes allotted for Q&A after closing statements. Now, without further ado, it has been decided by the debaters that Dr. Winters will speak first. Christy, please begin with your opening. First, I'd like to thank the Skeptic Feminist for hosting, uh, Carl for joining, and also the audience for taking the time out of your day to watch this. Is feminism good for the world? Before I start, I think it's important to first ask the question, why do we need feminism? And to answer that, I'd like to paraphrase a YouTuber who summed it up, summed it up better than I think I've ever heard it done. And that was by Captain Andy, who's uh, reference number one below. And that is that when we compare the lives of men and women, they are so different that that difference is worth talking about. In Western nations, people encouraged by feminists, women and men, have been talking about these differences and the discrepancies between and within the sexes for a few centuries now, if we date it back to Mary Astle's 
1694, a serious proposal to the ladies, which argued that women should receive an education that includes more than preparing them to be wives to their husbands, but to develop their own intellects and abilities, reference to. Proceeding from this view that the difference between men and women's lives are worthy of our consideration, evaluation, and discussion, that brings us on to what to do when we see inequalities, inequities, discrimination, or marginalizations, and that is to do reform. I use as my definition of feminism today the following, a range of political movements, ideologies, and social movements that share a common goal to define, establish, and achieve political, sorry, equal political, economic, personal, and social rights for women. That's taken from Wiki, but it's based on reference three. I will focus initially on the specific ways that feminist principles inspired women and men to improve women's lives. These are the direct effects of feminism. Near the end, I will review what I call the indirect or knock-on effects by enumerating a few of the ways men have benefited from feminism as a set of values and from feminist activism. In answering yes to the question, is feminism good for the world, I will address the common objection framed as yes, but. To do so, I'm going to borrow shamelessly from the comedian Louis C.K., who talks about categories of things he calls, of course, but maybe, to describe his ambivalent comportment to search at certain social phenomena. It goes like this. Of course the world needed first wave feminism, generally seen as focusing on women's disadvantages in civil and political equality. Note four. Girls and women should be educated and have access to higher education. And the 19th century Europeans who derided the idea of women's education were as wrong and bigoted as the Taliban and other fundamentalists who preach against educating girls, Malala's campaign being the most famous example of the fight to educate girls are today. That's note five. Of course, women should be equal citizens in law, and feminist women and their male allies who work to reform voting laws, laws that denied women the right to their own earnings, inheritance laws, and reform of 19th century divorce laws were right. Today, we should support um, women who are legally second-class citizens in their own nations around the world so they can experience the benefits of first, that first-wave feminism brought primarily to white women standing more so than other women in, in the West. Of course the world needed second wave feminism, which sought to reform the sexual and family rights of women. Feminists in the US were right to point out that the personal was political while campaigning for, among other things, criminalizing marital rape in the 1970s to the 1990s, because no legislative body dominated by men until that point had, uh, to, had raised awareness or had dealt with the issue of marital rape, and to raise awareness of and encourage the prosecution of domestic violence, notes seven and eight. Shining a light on all forms of violence in the home are desperately needed around the world today, and especially in nations hostile to feminist movements where women are not provided with the resources needed to escape violence. Of course women should have access to contraception. We all know the ability to control the timing and number of pregnancies is vital to a woman's educational success and her ability to provide for her family. Note nine. Feminists are doing great work around the world helping women obtain access to contraception, note 10. Access to contraception and abortion are necessary for women's bodily autonomy. Of course, of course, of course. But maybe, the Louis C. paradigm goes, but maybe feminism has run its course in the US and the UK and other Western nations. Maybe self-identified feminist women and men should stop focusing on their own communities, stop focusing on their fellow citizens and their own countries, and instead devote all their time and efforts to feminist activism in non-Western countries. Before I continue, I would like to conclude that bit by saying that I think most people would agree that feminism and feminist activities have been a force for good in the world. I would go further by saying that most people would probably agree that women outside of Western democracies would be far better off, better protected under feminist inspired laws that would end the barbaric practices of female genital mutilation, note 11, of child brides, note 12, acid violence against women, <coughs> excuse me, note 13, and honor killings, note 14. We all know that feminism, as I have defined it, is the remedy to these gendered human rights violations. In the West, however, and to borrow from Fukuyama, are we at the end of feminism in the 21st century? That premise would be that the equality between the sexes has been achieved and feminism has nothing left to do. Personally, I would love to see that realized. I would love to see a society where when men and women and men experience life with equal fairness in the workplace, in the legal system, and in their private lives. However, I don't see evidence to support this. 
there are still far more work that needs to be done by feminists in the world, including in the West. Yes, many of the legal victories sought by first wave feminists have been achieved in Western nations, but there is still much to do when the, we come to the problems raised in the last century by second wave feminists. Imagine the fo following scenario. You go out with some friends for drinks and have an excessively good time. A few too many Jaeger bombs later, a friend takes you to his place so you can crash at his and you pass out on his couch. In the morning, you wake up with a foul taste in your mouth and also realize that you have dried semen on your lips and face. When you tell this to your friend, he informs you that after you passed out last night, he put his penis in your mouth and used it to get off. Clearly this is rape, right? You were orally penetrated while unconscious and unable to give consent. You've just been the victim of a crime, right? Well, not in Oklahoma. In the last week, a, state's, the state's, a state criminal appeals court decided that forced oral sex does not count as rape under the law in Oklahoma as currently written. A consequence of feminism in the West has been to alter the debate around rape to include more acts of violation and male victims. The feminist majority successfully campaigned to get the FBI to change its definition of rape to include counting men who were victimized. And this is a direct result of those femi of feminist ideals that have inspired feminists to right wrongs. Note 16. Until now, I have focused on the direct benefits that feminist activists work to achieve for women and girls. But in these last few minutes, I'd like to point out how feminism has had knock-on effects that benefit boys and men. There is a clear pattern in U.S. social movement history of feminists raising an issue that disproportionately impacts women. And that discussion then creates a space for men to talk about their experiences with that phenomenon. An example is domestic abuse. Second wave feminists took the lead on challenging uh, domestic abuse as what people used to consider a private matter and instead started to talk about it as a crime. This opened up a space for men who are victims of domestic abuse to discuss their experiences and how it uniquely impacts them, an example of intersectional feminism. Rape and rape culture are topics that feminists have been challenging for decades now. Recall the efforts to criminalize marital rape. Opening up these discussions created a public space for men and teen boys who have been victimized to talk about their experiences and for experts to see the various male myths that prevent men from reporting sexual assaults. And a final example, although there are many I could have chosen, Kirsten Gillibrand, an outspoken feminist U.S. Senator, shone a light on the number of rapes in the U.S. military, highlighting the stories of women who had served their nation and were let down by the soldiers who were supposed to have their backs <clears throat> after they had been raped by their fellow soldiers or superior officers. A survey of sexual assault and, I'm sorry, note 18. A survey of sexual assaults and rape in the military found a large number of men reporting rape and sexual assault as well, note 19. These problems, first raised because they disproportionately impact women, became wider discussions in society about the problem itself, and more victims come forward. Feminism encouraged the improvement of men's lives outside of these issues as well. Equal pay efforts means women bring home a fairer wage that helps families economically. The efforts in the U.S. for family leave, and this election cycle, paid family leave, benefit men. On a more practical level, widespread access to contraception means men benefit from women controlling the timing and number of their pregnancies. So in closing, feminism is a range of political movements, ideologies, and social movements that share a common goal to define, establish, and achieve equal political, economic, and social rights for women. Feminists, both men and women, work to achieve those goals by improving women's and men's lives around the world, allowing us to conclude that feminism is a force for good in the world. Thank you very much, Christy. Uh, that is 10 seconds. Uh, left to your time. I appreciate it. Um, now, uh, Carl, would you please begin your opening statement? Sure. And I'd like to start by thanking Christy by, uh, for standing up for a debate. In an environment where the most prominent, prominent feminist theorists fail to adequately engage with dissenting viewpoints and close themselves away in academia, I genuinely wish to thank her for this dialogue. Feminism is a social science, and therefore naturally uses the social science method of asking people things to gather data. As you can imagine, this leads to data that is hard to measure twice. Note 1. 
when 270 scientists on five continents decided to try and replicate 100 cognitive and social psychology experiments, 75% of these social psychology experiments could not be replicated. Even when the studies could be replicated, the results were consistently found to be exaggerated. I am sure that one contributory factor is the extremely high amount of political bias in American universities, note two. A 2014 study by the Higher Education Research Institute found that 59.8% of all under undergraduate facility at faculty nationwide identify as far left or liberal, compared with the only 12.8% as far right or conservative. This bias is even more pronounced in the social sciences. In a 2015 study, uh, note two again, I think, that found 58 to 66% of social scientists were left wing and only five to 8% right wing. And that means there are eight Democrats for every Republican. For the same reason, for, for some reason, conservatives aren't signing up in droves to do gender studies. Now, this has many effects on the social sciences, the first being on the very language used to describe the subjects. This is a quote from a Scientific American article. Duarte et al. found similar distorted language across social sciences, where, for instance, certain words are used to suggest pernicious motives when confronting contradictory evidence. Deny, legitimize, rationalize, justify, defend, trivialize, with conservatives as examples, as if liberals are always objective and rational. In one test item, for example, the endorsement of the efficacy of hard work was interpreted as an example of a rationalization of inequality. The inability to objectively interpret arguments is just the beginning of the problems that are caused by political bias. The data itself is highly suspicious. The following is from an article published in Science Journal. For some years now, data drawn from social networks has been used by both academic sociologists and brand marketers to help them understand human behavior. Many pro projects and proposals have been based on information sourced this way. One major problem stems from the dubious reliability of information engendered by the networks themselves. Ruths and Pfeiffer stress that members of a network are far from being truly representative of the general population. The common use of networks on social media is more likely to produce distortions due to bias. Consistent liberals are the group most likely to unfriend or block someone on the basis of opposing political views, leading to social networks that are deeply misrepresentative of the general population. If a liberal professor at a liberal college passes around a survey on social networks trafficked only by liberals, your data is only representative of liberals. It is unreliable due to political bias. If you can't rely on it, you can't draw any conclusions from it. This applies to other identities too. For example, Pinterest has a user base that is 80% women, source two again. And it certainly applies to the liberal college campuses with a focus on the social sciences, which are, of course, where many of feminism surveys are taken and carried out. Take, for example, the one in five students have been sexually assaulted or raped myth. Christopher Krebs and Christine Lindquist, the senior research social scientists at RTI International in the Center for Justice, Safety and Resilience, wrote an article in Time magazine where they say, as the two of the researchers who conducted the campus sexual assault study from which the number was derived, we feel we need to set the record straight. Although we used the best methodology available to us at the time, there are caveats that make it inappropriate to use the one in five number in the way it's being used today, as a baseline or only statistic when discussing our country's problem with rape and sexual assault on campus. They specifically say that the survey is not representative and includes not only rape but any sexual act that could legally constitute a crime and that it was web-based, shared around social media, with a 42% response rate. They literally say, we simply have no way of knowing whether sexual assault victims were more or less likely to participate in our study. They specifically say that it is not representative, but that hasn't stopped feminists the world over from misappropriating this dubious study to justify their cry-bully demands for safe spaces and special treatment. Gary Gutting is a professor of philosophy at the University of Notre Dame, and he has this to say on how trustworthy data gathered by social science is. Above all, we need to develop a much better sense of the severely limited reliability of social scientific results. Media reports of research should pay far more attention to these limitations, and scientists reporting the results need to emphasize that they don't show as much as they think they do. Given the limited predictive success and lack of consensus in the social sciences, their conclusions can seldom be primary guides to setting policy. At best, they can supplement the general knowledge, practical experience, good sense, 
and critical intelligence that we can only hope our politicians will have. Popular feminism, now newly intersectional and all-encompassing, is presented as a comprehensive worldview with a magnitude bordering on the religious. It is based on data that is unreliable and draws conclusions that are deeply biased and declares them to be an accurate representation of reality to which we must all conform. With foundations this unstable, what kind of person would build a career, let alone a society, on them? Well, thank you very much. That uh, leaves you a good four four minutes of uh, of time. That's so, okay. Okay, doke. Uh, well, next is the uh, two rounds of formal rebuttals, and they will be lasting five minutes each. Christy? All right, I'm just hitting the timer on mine. So I have to say, in terms of rebutting, I'm a little bit confused because I was expecting um, some sort of frame that answered the question, is feminism good for the world, and no, in, in a way more directly. And what I've heard is a, a lot of things sort of complained about, but not a coherent answer as to why feminism isn't a force for good in the world. And I think that there, are, I just have to correct some errors. I think one of the first things Carl said was that feminism is a social science. And certainly in the social sciences, we use a feminist perspective. So there are many ways that when you examine the world, you want to pay attention to the way that uh, it impacts men and women because there might be similarities and there might be differences. The way to evaluate sex differences, the way to evaluate gender norms in a society is through feminist theory. And so it is uh, really, feminist theory is the way to problematize or examine sex differences, gender norms in a society. And that's why it's used in economics and political science and communications and anthropology because it is the framework just as if you wanted to examine class divisions between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, you would have to go back to Marx because he came up with the idea and everyone who followed on from him used those ideas. It's the same thing with feminist theory. It was feminists who started to point out and draw attention to the differences between men and women in society. So just because something is feminist doesn't necessarily make it not, not credible because it's a lens through which to analyze social phenomena. You can also do it through racial justice. You can do it through rational choice theory. You can do it through other forms of theoretical frameworks that are available in the social sciences. I also want to pick up on uh, Carl's note of the social network data. And social network data is different from survey data. Social network data and social media data are relatively new phenomena, and they are highly skewed because not because the data are bad inherently or because the re researchers are unreliable, but simply because it, people who use it are not representative of a full range of population. And we're seeing with deeper penetration, with more people getting access to places like Twitter and the internet, with um, internet access reaching out into more and more rural areas, we're seeing more people join on to social media. But to paint social network analysis as being the same as survey data, I think is disingenuous and just wrong. I mean, survey methodology has been um, practiced long before social media even existed. You know, the famous um, attempts at telephone surveys to predict American elections when they realized that people who had telephones had more money and therefore were more likely to vote for the Republican candidate, which skewed the results. So using statistical probabilities and sampling, you know, there's um, entire industries that are set up, uh, up public opinion polling, marketing, requires um, accurate data. And for the markets to work, they have to understand their customers. And they use sampling frames to get uh, representative samples in order to generalize to the population because they want to target the right people with the right data. If all social science data was unreliable, we wouldn't have good marketing. We wouldn't be able to, you know, have companies do successful marketing campaigns. And so I think while I have still a minute and a half left, what perhaps is most disappointing is the, that Carl's obsession with the ivory tower. My concerns about feminism in the world it deals with activism. It deals with things like um, identifying, um, you know, 
creating spaces for victims to talk about uh, their victimization now that the FBI has changed its definition, dealing with the fact that laws no longer protect people because we've talked about rape as a form of consent rather than being just about a man penetrating a woman you know, vaginally, that there are important campaigns going on about honor killings, which is a problem in the UK. Girls in the UK are being killed in honor killings, and that's an issue that needs to be talked about. Female genital mutilation happens culturally, not just in developing countries, but around the world. There are child bride issues. Um, so, and, and there's you know, a lot of issues that I think are, these are interesting discussions to have, but when it comes to improving the lives of men and women, I think the answer really does, I mean, I think I'm making a better case here for activism in the world, um, not just looking at the, the ivory tower and how people talk about it in published journals. And with that, I'll yield the remainder of my, my 40 seconds back to the moderators. All right. Thank you very much, Christy. Carl, you may begin your five minutes rebuttal. Just because something is feminist doesn't mean it's not credible. It's because it's biased, politically driven social science that it's not credible. But anyway, I want to talk about why the patriarchy allows women to have rights. Western feminists don't talk about the actual rape cultures going on in patriarchies that they actually don't allow women rights and institutionally oppress them with laws specifically against women. Instead, feminists convince themselves they live under a patriarchy by redefining the term. No longer does patriarchy mean that women are the property of their fathers and husbands. Now it represents some omnipresent force that can never accurately be pinpointed but merely hinted at in an infinite number of subtle and coincidentally minor inconveniences for the feminist in question. Western feminists redefine another hyperbolic word to describe the effect of this phallocentric conspiracy theory, oppression. When the patriarchy enforces gender binary by presenting girls' toys in pink and boys' toys in blue, our feminist considers this a form of oppression because other people accept this and might even hold an opinion on the subject. This leads to first world feminists making media from the comfort of their warm, dry, plush rooms, wearing makeup and smiling at the camera while surrounded by luxury to make the ridiculous claim that they are being oppressed because sometimes they have to do something all orchestrated by an invisible force whose sole purpose for existence is to make their life slightly less easy than it could have been. Western feminists have the goal to redefine a word that describes the result of genuine systems of discrimination and subjugation, and then appropriate that word to describe their everyday annoyances. This is why people hate feminism. It's for whiny, entitled, lazy, first world women. But the redefinition of words doesn't stop there. Next is sexism usually understood to mean prejudice, stereotyping, or discrimination on the basis of sex. Well, thinks our first world feminist. It certainly can't claim, I certainly can't claim that sexism is the reason that my laziness and entitlement haven't somehow landed me a job at a Fortune 500 company. However, if a feminist redefines sexism to mean systems of the world in which I live are designed to prevent me from achieving the job I have through the patriarchal mechanism of high standards, then I can nag my way into positions of power by finding a company with people who are obviously not sexist and then accuse them of sexism or worse, attacking them through their own good intentions and most importantly, saving the feminist from doing anything approaching hard work. Hashtag believe women. But more than a vehicle for feminists to con their way into careers for which they are underqualified, the redefinition of sexism has opened the door to unbridled and often repulsive man-hatred. This is achieved by the use of the childish method of adding up the total number of men and total number of women in the workplace, finding that more men work than women, and then deciding that this is because men have set up a system to oppress women because in the highest paying vocations, the majority are male. By this logic, women, are a women as a class are oppressed by all men all through history and into the modern day which is why the wage gap myth won't die. It doesn't matter that men are working longer and harder for their money. In aggregate, they earn more than women, and therefore there are feminists demanding reparations. Hashtag, give your money to women. Of course, this synchronizes wonderfully with the redefinition of sexism. So now not only are all men oppressing all women using sexist institutionalized power, but women can't even be sexist in return. So no matter how openly bigoted and hateful they are towards men, it is totally justified because of their redefinition of these words. Feminism is Orwell's nightmare come to life with a bright smile, rainbow hair, and a jingle in the background by people so pathologically entitled they campaign against other people's human rights. And let's not forget when we abandon the inverse doublespeak of the feminist lexicon and return to the standard English definitions, the only women these terms apply to are the ones feminists are busy erasing so they can pollute the media with their own petty and selfish needs. Hashtag manspreading, manslaming, Man-splanning, man-shaming, fucking man-hating.
Thank you, Carl. Uh, please, both of you, remember to use your uh, sources when making the rebuttals as well. Christy, your final rebuttal. Yes, thank you very much. So, I have to say that um, what I'm really hearing from Carl is complaints that he finds other people's opinions offensive. And while he is certainly entitled to be offended by what other people say online and, and what they express, that doesn't really provide justification for us to say that feminism, to the answer the question, is feminism a force for good in the world? No. He's entirely ignoring all of the activism that I pointed out in my initial opening statement. He's not addressing the issue of honor killings and how that is a highly and that is a gender practice. It's happening in the UK, and yet he's not bringing that up. We're not talking about the, the need to redefine rape in order to get male victims counted, seen as the victims that they are, so that they can be dealt with in the justice system. What I feel that Carl is doing is just throwing around a lot of stereotypes buzzwords and making a lot of you know sort of hasty generalizations based on what a, a few people that he sought out have said online and from that wanting to discount over 150 years of work trying to improve women's lives around the globe half the population's lives around the globe and I just don't feel that he's taking this debate particularly seriously these are important issues about the quality of people's lives about girls education and also extending the way that feminists have established new discourses in a, in a public situation like rape that then when they do the surveys as I pointed to about taking the survey about rape in the US military male victims are coming forward as a consequence of women taking up an, a crime that disproportionately affects women it then has a knock-on effect we've talked about the importance of access to contraception and the attacks on that at least in the United States and there are global issues that don't deal with the first world that if um, actually I think if the skeptic fem feminists I'd sent you about 42 references I didn't see them all in the links below but in my links I've got um, links to the feminist majorities campaign on helping women um, who are like suffering under uh, the, the Sultan of Brunei's near Taliban policies about policies to stop female genital mutilation, policies to end acid violence against women. And although I'm sure for YouTube it is very convenient to spend a lot of time attacking stereotypes of feminists and talking about women on Tumblr with blue hair, that doesn't really deal with the real world. And I think if we're going to have a serious debate, we need to move beyond people fighting in the, on the internet, in, in, the, in the Twitter sphere, and actually look at what feminism is doing on a daily basis for people's lives. The fact that we all, at least in the West, have access to contraception, in part, at least in the US, starting because Margaret Sanger was seeing how uh, uncontrolled pregnancies was destroying women's health, it was destroying families' economic stability, and it was destroying women's lives. And it was a massive step culturally and scientifically to move forward into the medicine to get us to the point where women can control our fertility and then huge knock-on effect that that has because until that time unless you were using the, the cycle method of only having sex you know uh, certain times of the month the entire burden for contraception fell on men either through condoms or withdrawal and so feminism by bringing up the issue of contraception has basically made it possible for everyone to have a lot more and better sex and that's actually really important I mean it's important for the quality of life in terms of you know as being a human being who has sexual drives and living in a world where every time you had sex you didn't know if you're gonna have another child maybe adding to the fourth or fifth one that you have that's a burden that we no longer face in the West, but women in the Philippines, women in developing countries, especially Catholic countries, don't have that kind of access. Those families don't have that kind of protection. And I think that that's really a much better place to be focusing on rather than on the stereotypes, um, buzzwords, and also um, just not naming names. I'm sure that uh, Carl, if he named it, could name all the popular feminists, but if there are all these thousands of feminists who are out there doing these things, I think he would probably be able to name specific names and cite specific instances instead of just speaking in generalities. So again, I don't see any reason, convincing reason, to refute the idea that yes, feminism has been good, a force for good in the world based on his comments. And I yield my time back to the moderators. Thank you very much, Christy. Uh, Carl, your Final rebuttal, please. Sure. Nobody's debating whether feminism has been good for the world. The question is whether it is good now. 
And these are important issues, Christy. You're right. Which is why an anti-scientific, self-serving, supremacist ideology is not the solution. Please try to keep up and not stop telling me how you feel. You can try to raise the reality of modern feminism if you want, but this willful ignorance is killing feminism. Because, look, everything about feminism is logically inconsistent. Imagine believing that an overarching power was oppressing you, then haughtily appealing to that power to stop oppressing you. Why would it stop? When, when complaining about the wage gap, if women really could be paid less because of their gender, why hire men? If women really are losing $400,000 per year and becoming a poor, oppressed underclass living in a pink-collar ghetto, why do they account for 85% of consumer spending? Why are women even treated like an oppressed minority when they aren't? In the United States, a country with women's rights, equality, the law, and universal suffrage, 50% of the population are women. Uh, note four, I think, I think. But if one were to look at Saudi Arabia, a place which is actually oppressive to women, they have a female population of only 43%. Bahrain is just like this, with a female population of only 38%. And believe it or not, according to the World Bank, the United Arab Emirates' female population is only 26%. Now, I'm no fancy-schmancy social scientist, but, you know, I don't know whether correlation implies causation in these cases, but isn't that what social science is for? Shouldn't feminists be looking at the data of what appears to be deeply oppressed populations of women who seem to actually be suffering under their yoke? Don't any of them think this is the most important feminist issue? It's even more important than the color of toys in a kid's store. Instead, they are busy inventing conspiracy theories about the West, where, about oppression where none can be measured to exist. And now that feminism is insectional, it must consider the lived experiences of black, gay, and trans people using the same logic. Replace man with white, woman with black, straight with gay, cis with trans, and voila! Through the magic of feminist logic, now everyone's oppressed. White men hold most of the top jobs in majority white countries, white supremacy at work. Despite there being a black president at the top. Sorry, half black. I'm sure that really matters to the racists, who I presume are voting for the white half. And are majority African countries black supremacists? Nothing about feminism or inter the intersectional monster it spawned has any logical consistency to it whatsoever. So new and exciting explanations must be invented through the feminist's second magical power, the ability to read minds. More men than women in STEM? STEM? That's because those men are misogynistic. They don't hire women because they hate them. More black people in jail than whites by proportion? That's because the majority white police force is racist and they hate them. You don't have any gay people on your television show, that's because you're homophobic and you hate them. The ability to discern the true motivations of people that they've never met is nothing short of miraculous, to the point where they have identified, and I quote, that literally everything and everyone is problematic. This politically correct witch hunt has left feminism pointing the finger at every single institution, cultural event, and individual for all of recorded history. Then viewing the world through the intersectional system of oppression means there's nowhere to escape from one's inherited privilege and no way of absolving a straight white male from the original sin of being born to the wrong gender, developing the wrong sexuality, and receiving the genetic heritage of the wrong race. What I'm saying is, if you believe that everything in the world is wrong despite all the evidence to the contrary, then perhaps you should stop pointing the finger at others and consider pointing it at yourself. This is really happening, Christy. These are the popular feminists, Christy. This is the popular feminist narrative. You can deny it all you want, but like I said, this denial is killing feminism. I yield. Thank you very much, Carl. Next are the five-minute closing statements. Uh, Christy, please go ahead. Thank you very much. So when we were asked the question, is feminism a, a force for good in the world, I brought, um, I did the research in order to look at uh, the world itself and the history of feminism and where it's going now. And I'm very disappointed that Carl has chosen to use his time to use buzz, buzzwords, but he can't cite sources. If you noticed in his last two rebuttals, he stopped actually listing any real sources. And that's because he's using buzz, buzzwords and contempt and not evidence-based grounded arguments. If there, there was such a problem with women or feminists, men and women who are feminists saying these things, instead of just using generalities and making assumptions about what people are doing, for instance, you know, reading people's minds, he would be able to go through and list feminist after feminist after feminist after feminist saying these things. But he can't because he constructs the arguments rather than citing the evidence. And I also find it very 
um, confusing that on the one hand, Carl utterly dismisses social science data as pointless, useless, constructed by a bunch of liberals in the ivory tower, and then com complains that I'm not using the social science data that he is dismissing as not being credible. At the end of the day, what Carl is trying to do here is move the topic away from the question of feminism in the real world over to an internet-based discourse of buzzwords and phrases that he can't substantiate with evidence that he's not providing sources for. And so when we look at the day-to-day -day activities, if you go to the website of NOW, if you go to the website of Feminist Majority, they are doing campaigns for women in their own countries, they're doing campaigns for women abroad. We're seeing that the Feminist Majority on Rape is Rape made an effort to include penetration in a way that included male victims. So we're seeing that men are benefiting from feminism. We're seeing the effects of uh, women advocating for contraception access and the way that that's improved lives. I've talked about the way that working for family leave and paid family leave has improved families' economic statuses. So when I talk about feminism, I'm focused on real life solutions to real life problems. And while that's not of you know interest to Carl because that's not clearly what his focus is, I don't think that our time is best spent talking about what people on Tumblr are talking about. I think that there is real world activism that needs that is going on, that needs to be supported, that needs to be praised. And I also basically reject the characterization of academia and the social sciences from my own personal experience. If, if Carl would like to say his personal experience with higher education, how many sociology classes he's taken, how many academic journals he's read, and has he actually done research beyond Scientific America's blog or blogs that uh, summarize uh, studies, if he's actually gone in and read a lot of these studies himself, I think there's a characterization of what happens in academia and then there's what's happened in academia. And that's very, it's not that much different from what I see when creationists try to push the idea that evolutionists are promoting atheism in the classroom or evolutionists are promoting atheists in college universities by teaching evolution. The idea that these things are happening on a similar fashion with feminism is just also refuted by the facts. Now, had I known that Carl was going to have a discussion about the social sciences instead of feminism, I would have prepared that. But I would like to stay focused on the question, is feminism a force for good in the world? And I think undoubtedly, when we look at first wave feminism and second wave feminism and feminism activism, even as it's going on today, we're seeing improvement in people's lives, we're seeing the identification of blind spots, gendered blind spots of male victims, we're seeing blind spots in rape laws, we're seeing opportunities to improve people's lives um, in the developed world and in the developing world. And so in conclusion, based on the arguments and evidence and the vitriol and the hasty generalizations and the lack of substantiated accusations aside, I think the preponderance of evidence really must fall down on the side of yes, feminism is a force for good in the world. I yield my time. Thank you both very much. Um, I suppose what we can do is use the uh, spare oh, time. Carl's got a closing. Carl's got a closing. He's got his closing five minutes. Of course. I, my apologies. Please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, well done yeah. for attacking the man and not the argument, Christy, constantly. I am citing studies. I'm citing statistics, and yet you won't accept it. And that doesn't surprise me from someone whose entire career is based on feminism and can in undoubtedly see the bleak future that feminism is going to enjoy. Look, I'm talking about the real world. When Barack Obama says one in five women have been raped, there's a 77% pay gap, blah, 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 these are things that are happening in the real world. And they're based on nonsense. We have the people who did the study telling us so. Feminism is not based on reliable empirical data. It is riddled with bias, as are you, Christy. I could give you a list of famous, prominent academic and popular feminists if you want after this debate. That's easy. I do that on a daily goddamn basis. All right? Feminism has conclusions warped by political bias. It is on the verge of collapsing under its own inconsistencies and requires Orwellian levels of control to maintain via the suppression of other people's rights. Feminism is not good for the world because the world is where reality is and reality is the mortal enemy of modern day intersectional feminism. I wouldn't expect feminism to be able to produce an empirical fact if it wanted to. And I certainly wouldn't expect feminism to provide an analysis rooted in reason. And given that many feminists seem to draw deep emotional and spiritual comfort 
from feminism, it's easy to see why they all think that the ends justify the means. Feminism is a cancer. It will not stop until it has it all, and then when it has it all, too many people will have invested too much of their lives to simply bring it to a halt, as you are an example of. So it will continue to invent new problems and new justifications for even more control than it already has of your thoughts, your speech, your actions, and your livelihoods, and it will all have been done for a good cause. I'll finish on this quote from C.S. Lewis. Of all the tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. It would be better to live under robber barons than to live under omnipotent moral busybodies. The robber baron's cruelty may sometimes sleep, his cupidity at some point may be satiated, but those who torment us for our own good will torment us without end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. They may be more likely to go to heaven, yet at the same time likelier to make a hell of earth. This very kindness stings with the intolerable insult, to be cured against one's will and cured of states that we may not regard as diseases, is to be put on a level with those who have not reached the age of reason, or those who never will, to be classed with infants, imbeciles, and domestic animals. This is feminism's literal end point. It's a bad thing for the world. End of story. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you both very much. Um, we can now do a Q&A from the chat uh, for the allotted 30 minutes. However, um, it seems as if basically everything has already been answered um, from the questions that have come up since. So we'll, we'll, take, a, we'll take the 30 minutes, I suppose, um, to wait for any new questions to come in, um, unless you... Either of you object to that? No, I'm fine with that. Yep. In the meantime, uh, either way, I would like to uh, very sincerely thank you both for um, for this debate. It's uh, not every day on YouTube that we have an actual structured debate, and uh, of course, we will restrain from the you know at populum fallacy of judging the winner by popularity or anything like that. It will be enough to let. Uh, your arguments stand on their own and let them convince who they may. Um, once again, we, we really would like to thank you both for, for doing this. Uh, I think it's a, a breath of fresh air to have uh, an actual structured debate uh, with you know, verified sources that uh, each person can go and, and verify themselves. And, and Christy, we will make it uh, to, to where all of your links are posted. Uh, apparently uh, it didn't save because it was too too long and then we had to start the debate but uh, we will uh, rearrange things to where they're all they're all in there by the time this is done processing. Question? I lost it. All right now we're just looking through the chat for any questions that have not yet been answered by your speeches. Uh, you may take this opportunity to uh, go back and forth with the free time that we now have, um, at least until a, a specific question comes up, if you like. Sure, okay. Uh, Christy, do you know what a bulverism is? I don't know if I could define it off the tip of my tongue, so if you wouldn't mind going ahead. Yeah, it's someone presupposing their conclusion and then explaining to someone how they got there, regardless of what happened. Right. I'm curious, Carl, what's your experience of social sciences at the university level? Uh, not at university level. They're only the uh, papers that I read from feminists, really. Okay. So you haven't actually taken a sociology class? Is it important that I have? Well, I'm just wondering in terms of like, yeah, sitting through a structured syllabus and knowing what the pedagogic mm -hmm. outcome is. No, wait, 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 wait. Um, uh, can I finish uh, making my point since you asked? Um, yeah, there is importance to understanding what a pedagogical goal of a course is. Now, for instance, with my course on, uh, you know, uh, a qualitative methods or quantitative methods, we learned how to be very skeptical in terms of the strengths and weaknesses. So for instance, why is a pr probability sample better than a quota sample? and how is internet surveys uh, comparable to face-to-face -face surveys. So the idea that data has to be understood in terms of its strengths and weaknesses is one of the things that you get 
in these courses, developing the critical skills to evaluate studies on their ends, on the sampling frame, on who participated, if it was undergraduate college students or if it was a random survey of telephone uh, participants of adults in the population. And so I think it is important to have some experience in what these classes are and what they teach to be credible when you critique them. Wow, that's interesting, Christy, and I'm not really interested in what your opinion of credibility is. I want to know why Barack Obama is giving the one in five college rape myth. Explain. I do. Why? You have to ask Barack Obama, but we're getting back to why you. But we can demonstrate that that's nonsense, right? Classroom when you've not actually sat through that yeah, any of those experiences. I'm no, asking, no, no. I'm arguing from experience. I'm asking you directly why the president of the United States is perpetuating a false feminist myth. That the and I said you would have to ask the president because I am not Obama. Me, I'm not the me. one putting exactly. out that information. And yet this, I'm not this the is my contention is that feminism is good for the world when this... Yes, I, I apologize. I had to mute you both. Please calm down. Um, if you're going to have uh, back and forth like that, it's, it's certainly... Uh, invigorating for the audience, no doubt, but uh, you will need to take turns if, if that is how you are going to um, spend this time. Uh, in the meantime, I do have a, a question here for Christy. Um, you've sort of answered, uh, answered this, but why don't you think feminists focus more on the developing world? I, I think they do. I think that if you go through my the references, the full list, you'll see several campaigns add um, um, that are directed at uh, ending female genital mutilation and ending child bride um, pro, uh, the practice of child brides. There's a there is actually quite a lot of feminist activism going on. It might not be on YouTube because there aren't a lot of feminist activists on YouTube talking about those things, but it is happening. And work with the United Nations to protect girls is also what feminist organizations do. So I'd say check out Feminist Majority, check out the National Organization of Women, check out a lot of the links that I'm going to I have provided as evidence that women that feminists and feminist organizations are focusing on the issues of women in the developing world. There's also the issue that women in the developing world are working on these issues and that we need to support, support those feminists and support those feminist organizations in their regions, their nations, so that women there are empowered and not just expect, you know, not, it's not up to Western women to swoop in or Western feminists to swoop in and fix everybody's problems. The issue is empowerment and we want to help and facilitate that. So those campaigns are out there to advocate for those who can't advocate for themselves, but also the aim is to empower women lo locally to have that kind of voice for themselves. Hang on, hang on. If feminism isn't here to solve the world's problems, then what good is it? Not only does it parrot false statistics to top politicians, but it's not here to help people in any meaningful way. I mean, no, it's is, not what I said about how are campaigns why, for please, please, general innovation not helping the Christy, world. Why is it that the viral hashtag campaigns feminists all get behind are never about the third world? Why is that? You can unmute her, please. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Christy, you, you, Christy, you need to un unmute yourself, please. Thanks, sir. I thought you had unmuted me for me. I see no evidence that that's the case. In fact, when I think back to the Boko Haram incident and Save Our Girls, wait, you you let you had your chance. Let me talk. Sure. Um, I see no evidence that of what you say. This is again an example where you're making uh, an accusation and you can't actually cite anything behind it. And you this is typical. Do of what you've been doing throughout the campaign. You, again, you had your moment. Let me answer the question. You know, you make these claims, make these assertions, but you can't back it up. And it's the same reason, like, I can't answer what's happening in Barack Obama's head. I don't think that it's appropriate or fair for you to make me or anyone an individual answer for anyone's views except their own. And so I'm not here to be a puppet for every kind of feminist and every what every feminist thinks, because I don't know. I can only speak to myself and the evidence that I present. And I would appreciate it if you would limit your questions to either the evidence I have presented or questions that I can answer from my own knowledge, not to speculate on what the president is thinking. You know, I actually thought you might be able to solve this on your own knowledge, being a social scientist and all. I thought you Why actually might be? be able. No, no, stop interrupting. I actually thought you might be able to explain why feminist misinformation is being parroted by the President of the United States. I mean, don't you think 
it's dangerous for feminism's image. Just why is feminism good in the world? Do you think people are going to think feminism is good in the world if all it does is fear monger? Fearmonger with false statistics that the, the presidents of major Western nations spout. Don't you think that's dangerous for feminism and deleterious to feminism? I would like to know how you think I could know what the president thinks. Just explain I'm that. your opinion. No, I'm no, 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 you're not asking. For the first time ever. No, 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 that's not but what I, you asked. Don't... You asked why is he doing it. You asked why is he doing it. And you asked why do these things happen. And I want to know how you think I can know that. Sargon, you will need to unmute yourself. You were speaking over her. Well, actually, she interrupted me. But, Christy, don't you think it's damaging for feminism's reputation to be parroting false statistics to politicians? I mean, why, why is there no more internal control? Why is it that the people who did this study had to write an article saying, look, stop using this statistic as fact? It's not. And yet, <laughs> it's still being used. Are you, are you serious? I mean, do you actually think you can go, well, I don't see any evidence, and think that people are going to go, well, you know what? I've seen evidence, but I'll ignore that because Christy hasn't seen evidence. You not presenting evidence of something is why I can't deal, you can't respond to it. And if a, if a person in the audience thinks they have evidence, that's, that's fine, but that's not who's being asked to present evidence here. You are. And I still don't understand why you think my opinion of what the print, the president might think about using that statistic is relevant or important. I'm not here to speak for other people. I'm here to speak to the evidence that we've presented here in the debate to answer the question, why is, femini is feminism good for the world? And I don't hear credible reasons why the access to contraception has not been good for the world, why dealing with rape and expanding the definitions and categories of victims of rape is not good for the world, while dealing with uh, issues of domestic violence that second wave feminists have started to raise is not good for the world. So um, it looks okay, like we've got other questions. Right. I'm not arguing that feminism in history didn't have a role. I'm saying that right now it doesn't have a role. Right now it isn't consistent. It doesn't make any sense. It's based on biased information that probably isn't true by the people who do the fucking studies. And they are literally saying, would you please stop doing this? And yet feminists won't. I'm not asking you to tell me what's in other people's heads. I'm asking you whether you think this is damaging feminism's reputation. All right. Um, well, let's move on to another question, if uh, Christy does not wish to respond to that. Uh, Sargon, question for you. Sure. Do you think more feminist feminism is needed in the Middle East? If so, why do you describe feminism as a negative force? I don't think that a movement with such logical inconsistencies based on such bad, irre almost irrelevant data is needed anywhere. There are other movements for human rights other than feminism, despite what feminists would have you believe. Christy, any comments on that? Well, it, only the fact that if you want to look at the difference between men and women in any societies, you're using a feminist critique you're using feminist theory, you're drawing on the work that has been developed by feminist scholars going back now for several decades in academia, and that's why feminism is useful. It's because it allows us to go to places like the Middle East and analyze the gender norms, analyze the power bases and status based on sex, and critique them against things like Western liberal secularism and compare it with religious um, evaluation. So you, if you are looking at the differences between men and women, if you're looking at gender norms in a society, you're doing feminism. All right, uh, another Can question. Oh, because yes, please, go ahead. Feminism isn't a motive, it's not a method, it's an ideology. No, feminism, it's a method. No, no, feminism does not have, no, it's not, and it does not have the monopoly on saying we're going to analyze gender, and if anyone analyzes gender, they're doing feminism. That's nonsense, that's massive overreach, it's totally unjustifiable. Okay, what other theoretical framework allows you to evaluate sex differences and I gender just, differences in a society? Is, is there literally, do you honestly literally think you cannot just analyze something without becoming part of an ideology. If you are looking at differences in sex and gender, that is based on feminist critique and feminist theory. No, You're doing that's just feminist something critique. feminism specializes in. It's not based on feminism. I can do an okay. objective analysis of some empirical data, and it happened to be about gender, 
and not be a feminist and not be doing feminism. All right, but how are you going to evaluate that? You look at the differences, and then what do you Reasonable do? What? What? No, 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 no. This is it. You need. This is science. Needs science works with theory. Yes, science works. I, wait, let me finish. Science works with theory. Theories are, is the interlinking uh, sentences that describe a causal outcome through processes, and it allows you deductively to develop hypotheses that can be tested. So if you're just looking at data and you're describing it, you're yeah, that's one thing you can do. But if you want to analyze it and understand it theoretically, you need a theoretical framework. If you want a scientific approach, then you're going to need theory, and the theory you're going to use is feminism. No, the theory you're going to use is feminism. Other people will use different theories like to what? analyze this data. I don't know. Like I don't what? care. Exactly. Like what? You don't have a response because choose it's feminism. Choose a scientific discipline. They can choose psychology. They can use, choose biology. They can choose evolutionary That's psychology. Theory. They can choose any discipline they want. But feminism is just one of many. And you're trying to claim this ideological hegemony. It's creepy. The no, because... You think that literally no one can look at a, a, an analysis of gender... And not be a feminist is mental to okay. me. Okay, evolutionary. Okay, like evolutionary um, psychology is looking at the impact of the of of how societies are influenced by having evolutionary outcomes. But that's not doing an analysis of gender norms in a society. If you want to look again, the fact that you can't come up with an answer analysis itself is feminism. Okay. Okay. If you can't come up with an alternative theory, for instance, like you can use rational choice theory in political science, or you can use expressive theory or sociological theories I, to I, understand. I understand why. your position, Christy. Please, please stop and let me finish. There's a lot of times where we have model competition where we take different models and we use the same data and we run models to see which theory performs the best. So again, if you're saying people can use, biology is a discipline, it's not a theory. Psychology is a discipline, Sorry, it's not a theory. Psychology. Would you please stop? I know you said evolutionary Sorry, you're psychology, gonna miss, you're gonna miss but evolutionary, and as I saying, said, I will respond evolutionary to psychology is an approach that attempts to explain outcomes in our society looking at the influence of, of evolution. It doesn't look at gender norms, it doesn't look at yeah, sex Wrap it up, Christy. So, what I'm saying is, if you can't give an example of an alternative theory to feminism, you're admitting that feminism is the valid way to understand sex and gender in a society. Okay, I'd like to respond to that. That is a lovely Kafka trap you have there. You're either a feminist or you don't know you're a feminist. But the thing is, Christy, Not right, you think, you think there is no evolutionary basis for gender roles. You think... No, I never said that. Then it is entirely possible to talk about gender roles from an evolutionary psychology perspective. Is that correct? I would have to look at the literature. What I've seen in terms of evolutionary psychology is like why men likes boobs more than butts. Right, so it's your ignorance on the subject means you can't answer the question. That I won't speak to something I haven't researched shows yeah, sure. that I'm a cautious sure, researcher yes. and yes. that I'm not going to make general, sure. generalizations or talk about things that I haven't, courses I haven't sure. sat through, for instance. Okay, but that's the point. I can or do something by a different that I haven't discipline taken. to feminism. So, you know, you simply have this obsession with feminism. It's, you don't why is it an obsession? Only... This is an ad hominem listen, attack. Listen, listen, listen. You're ad hominem attacking me. Stop interrupting and listen, Christy. No, no, I, no, I think no, I have no, to no, say no, that you if you're going to insult me, that the moderator should intervene here. Christy, answer, let, let me answer the question, right? Oh, what, hold on, Sarga, hold on. No. All right. Um, I, I, we would like to m move on to a new question, so please... Um, each of you, go ahead, Sargon, first, and then um, if you have anything else to add, Christy, please keep it civil. Thank you. Sorry, what's the question? Uh, no, we're, we're ready to move on to another question if you guys... Oh, right, okay, yeah, sorry, yeah. Topic. Okay. Let's see. Question for Christy. Um, which one do you want me to do? Do this one. Okay. Would you think women that are stoned to death by government sanction need feminism more than college students suffering from perceived microaggressions? Actually, I think this is... Why did you choose this one? That is not a... I mean, go ahead, you can answer it if you like, but I think the answer is obvious. Yeah, I think feminism um, addresses problems in different societies in different ways. An example of this would be looking at this gap in like the, the rape law in Oklahoma. When the male-dominated legislatures initially crafted the legal definition, they had a specific notion of rape in their minds, which had to do with you know men penetrating women in certain in certain ways. 
But as the discussion about rape has evolved because of the con because of feminist activism, feminist feminists talking about rape, we've we conceptualized it as dealing with consent issues and we broaden the kinds of things that we consider sexual assault and rape now and now that we have this understanding more victims can come forward more crimes can be prosecuted people can be uh, educated to understand what consent is and how it works so they can protect themselves from violating the law or violating um, you know going too far or not knowing that they're engaging in something that really they should be thinking twice about and identifying those gaps in the law and redressing them, as Oklahoma will have to do now, shows that we need feminism in the West because the societies keep changing. So it's not about who needs feminism more. It's about how is feminism best able to improve the lives of people based on their situations. Carl? Sorry, can you remind me, remind me of the question there, please? Uh, yes. Go ahead and... Bring it back for me. Uh, the question is, would you think women that are stoned to death by government sanction need feminism more than college students suffering from perceived microaggressions? This was a question for Christy, but uh, sure, I'll comments. Um, I don't think anyone needs feminism. I think people need, uh, well, movements that are going to defend their human rights. I am so sick of seeing feminists trying to literally infringe on human rights by shouting people down and no platforming them that I don't trust feminism with people's human rights. I think any other movement would be a good start. I mean, just go to the humanist societies, talk to them. I mean, go to the Quilliam Foundation. These people are actually doing real work. They're not sitting there doing an ideological navel gaze, going, well, actually, you haven't presented me evidence, and this isn't politically biased enough. You know, it just don't, don't worry about feminism. There are other people doing other things. Don't let them think that they have the monopoly on talking about gender or talking about women's issues, because they don't. All right, thank you very much. Um, we have a question for Sargon. Does funding for feminist organizations do anything to stop sexual assault? I guess, do you think? Obviously, overshooting the mark and beating an overblown statistic is not a bad thing. Um, okay, I don't, I don't know whether funding between fe funding to feminist organizations is impacting sexual or domestic assault, whichever it was, I have no idea. And, you know, you would think that there would be some research to tell me whether this is happening or not, but I haven't seen it, so. Okay. Uh, any thoughts, Christy? Well, it's been several years since I've been on a university campus, and we didn't, um, from what I remember, we had a women's center uh, that was funded at our undergraduate university campus. And they would do things like uh, put up, uh, a lot of information around campus about uh, getting drunk at house parties. If you remember in the United States, drinking age is 21, and so a lot of people will go to house parties and drink, and there's a lot of um, opportunities for women to be taken advantage of in those situations. And so they would do a lot of awareness about consent, what is consent, and also um, help host the safe walk home. So if you needed a walk on campus, they were uh, monitoring that. And they were also doing things um, on uh, 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 take back the night and campus safety, campus safety issues. So it might not be a, a direct impact, but through perhaps advocating for lighting very dodgy places on campus, providing walks for people who need them home, and raising awareness of consent and the dangers of, you know, of, of drinking and uh, being in, on a, you know, out, uh, I think they were doing their best to try to prevent sexual assaults. Can I make a point there? Of course. This, this all presupposes that there is some terrible problem with sexual assault on campuses in America. There isn't. There literally isn't. I mean, the, the, the rate of sexual assaults on campuses in America is lower than in the surrounding cities. So, you know, this, this dramatic fear feminists have drummed up using the one in five statistic that the authors of the statistics say don't use is just nonsense. Can I ask, Carl, what's an acceptable level, a level of sexual assault on campuses for you? Christy, do you think there is such a thing as an acceptable level? Well, you just said that, that it's not a problem. So, and, but then you also said it's lower than in the city. So if sorry, it's lower sorry. than in the city... Comparatively. Comparatively. Okay. It is a tiny, tiny problem compared to simply the leaving the campus becomes more dangerous for women. Right. I mean, so you, at what point... You can get that number down to zero, do you? 
well, that's what I'm asking. At what point is it not a problem? And at what point does it become a problem for you? I'm asking for your okay, opinion. For me, when it's a lower issue than the surrounding area, it's not something for me to worry about. The surrounding area it is more dangerous for women. So you would think since more women are raped off university campuses, feminists would be more interested in talking about that given the higher number of victims. But for some reason, they're not. So and by that logic, then police should really only concentrate on areas where there are reported sexual assaults, but it's only the highest areas that should get attention. The lower areas shouldn't get attention. I'm not what quite sure how the resources how the resources are meant to be distributed. So we shouldn't be focusing on campus sexual assault. We should be focusing on sexual assault off campus because that's more dangerous. But then how do you deal, deal with the sexual assaults that take no, place Christy, on campus? Christy, right? The statistics about campus sexual assault are lied about. Do you, do you accept this? Well, wait, you've just said that they're lower, so how can you no, know no, no, they're listen, lower if listen, they're lied listen, about? Listen, right? The statistics are lower. The, if you go to the, the FBI and get the actual statistics, it's something like uh, 0.63 per thousand or something to 0.72 or something like that. I'd have to look it up. I didn't think to have this to hand. Um, but feminists go around saying it's 20%. 20%. Now, do you not think that this misinformation is a problem? Well, again, I'm, is, are they lying about the statistics? And if they're lying about the statistics, then why are you using them? Because they're lying about the statistics. The authors of the right. study, they, listen, the authors of the study they are citing as one in five have been sexually assaulted have said, this is not representative, you can't use the study like this, please stop using it. And yet feminists are using it still. What do but you, you don't do trust social science data. Them? Because the, the people who did it say it's not reliable. That's why, why are I don't you trust using it. it? I'm not using it. I'm trying to stop other people using it, Christy. Can you please answer the question? Do you <laughs> think feminists should say that one in five women on college campuses have been raped or sexually assaulted? But if you don't accept the data as valid, then so why you are you citing it in comparison to rapes off of campus? You, you want to have it I'm not both citing ways. it, Christy. I'm telling you it's not right. I'm trying to stop feminists from citing it. Right. Then how do you know what the right statistics are? Because the government collects these statistics. Okay, so when the government collects, so which government statistics are we talking about? We're talking about the statistics by the FBI, I believe it is. Uh, on what? Sexual In assault what years? on campuses. In what years? Christy, can you answer my question? Yeah, this is the question. No, no, you Christy, want to dismiss, Christy, my question is no, very you clear. want to dismiss social you, science data you, as unreliable, but then you, you want to think? cite it Feminist to discredit feminists. So you discredited can't both have statistics. the data and well, you, say that you're using it and I then discredit it. I do have the data, Christy. If you want to wait, Where? I'll Google it for you. Do you want me to do that? Please. Right, okay. <laughs> okay. No, please. Uh, Google it. We've got five minutes left. Google it. We've got time. Yeah, yeah. No, in fact, Christy, right, I'm not going to do it until you answer my question. Do you think feminists should cite a study that the people who authored the study say not to cite? I don't see how that answers the question. Is feminism? I'm not, answering, I'm not answering your question. I'm asking the question. Do yeah, I'm not. I don't see how that addresses a debate question. Study. I don't see how that addresses the question. Is feminism oh, yeah. a force for good or oh, yeah. no? Okay. Uh, Are moving you on. It's a force Google. for misinformation, Christy. You Google. Find that FBI report. Well, Christy, I'll and do that in another time if I want, and I've covered it in other no. videos. So We're going to move on now. No, you want it, You have to okay. cite it here. Argument from ignorance. Christy, your bolverism is showing. Stop it. All right, uh, I muted you both. Um, feel free to unmute yourself after I'm done asking the next question. This may be our last one that we can fit in. Um, Christy, uh, also Sargon, feel free, to, of course, to pitch in. Um, what are feminists working on to stop um, the rape of men or to include uh, the rape of men in the law? And also, uh, kind of in the same vein, domestic violence uh, against men. And um, further, I guess, uh, to re slightly rephrase it for, for Sargon, would be uh, what other organizations do you feel are doing a better job? Well, I, you know, I'm not in this. Is, I'm not a field. Um, this isn't my area of expertise. So what I can do is point to things that I've already cited in the evidence, which is that when the feminist majority was working on the rape is rape campaign, they included in their activism the expansion of the definition so that men 
who are victimized are counted. Now, in my 10-minute opening, I mentioned that feminism is directed at improving uh, women's disadvantaged statuses. And you can go back for the precise quote. Um, and that is the direct effect. Then there are the knock-on effects. The knock-on effects like when um, issues of rape are, are coming up, then men who I think feminists should be allies to men who want to advance men's disadvantaged positions in areas like uh, domestic violence, in rape. That's when feminists become allies to help solve the problem. But if feminists take over solving men's problems for them, then we are no longer allowing the people who are the ones who need their voices heard to speak. So actually, it's in my view, I think that that's why I talk about feminism and its knock-on effects. And I also think it's important that when men want to speak up about their victimization, whether it's domestic abuse or rape, that feminist men and women are then allies to support them. But I don't think that it is makes sense for feminists to take over the men's rights agenda. I think that men who um, should have the voices to speak to their experience, their lived experience, their intersectionality, and how it how laws and the lack of good laws has impacted them. Okay. So that would be my answer in terms of how um, you know feminists can help in that way, which is to be good allies you, and to continue with the knock-on effects. Uh, Sargon, uh, you will have the last word. Uh, sorry, can you remind me what the question was, please? Yes, uh, the, the question in the general gist is uh, what are feminists doing, or I guess who can do it better than feminists in terms of stopping male rape or passing laws that uh, assist male victims of rape and domestic violence? What, who's, who can do what, just... Well, if not feminists, then who, basically? Or anyone, what more can feminists can do? do? Any, any activist group can do this. There's, there's nothing preventing anyone from, active, from being an activist. I mean, in the UK, we've got Fathers for Justice who have ma been making a big song and dance about themselves, trying to get things like this changed. Like, not necessarily rape laws, but um, the child custody laws. I mean, I'm, I'm not an MRA, so I'm no expert on these issues. But... Um, yeah, any any activist group can do this. It's just that feminists are the loudest and noisiest and have the most hyperbolic and inaccurate statistics that somehow get the most attention. I, I just can't imagine why that is. All right. Well, thank you both again very much. Uh, we do appreciate it. Christy Winters, uh, Carl Benjamin, a.k.a. Sargon of Akkad, um, thank you both. I'm sure everyone has thoroughly enjoyed this back and forth, and there will be much to parse out uh, with uh, future rewatchings of this debate. Uh, we may do this chat again, or this format again, with perhaps a more narrow topic in the future. If uh, you two or others are interested in something like this again, please do check out their channels. Uh, they will be posted in the description. And uh, please consider supporting us on Patreon. We are very happy to do this as often as possible. And the more support we have, the more often we can. So thank you very much. This has been a The Skeptic Feminist Debate. Thank you.